Kia ora everyone, uh, my name is Tom Kavanagh and today I'm going to discuss the relationship between sport, lockdowns and mental health from an autoethnographic perspective. At the time of writing uh, the abstract for this presentation, I'd only experienced one lockdown. But now, living in the Waikato, we've just moved to level two after spending the majority of the last few months in some form of lockdown. These uh, presented a lot of new challenges, uh, but today I'm going to focus on the New Zealand lockdown of 2020. And specifically, I'm going to look at the role sport played and how I coped with this scenario. First then, I think it's important to take a little time to discuss who I am, uh, where I'm from, uh, to provide some context for the tales I'll tell. In the late 19th century, my ancestors on both my mother's and father's side left famine-ravaged Ireland to pursue farming opportunities bequeathed to them in Aotearoa. They valued family, their Catholic faith, and somewhat ironically, they subscribed to a Protestant work ethic. Um, and they passed these values on to subsequent generations. The men of the family also engaged in rugby union as their chosen recreational activity, which promoted a set of discourses which aligned with their rural sensibilities easily. Of particular importance here is the notion of stoicism. Times were often hard for sheep and beef farmers throughout the 20th century, with no shortage of manual labour on offer, and rugby throughout this period was less about one-handed offloads and more about withstanding the trampling you'd experience at the bottom of a ruck. But under no circumstances were you entitled to air any concerns or seek support in either of these avenues. Conversations between men and my family have revolved around land prices and the fortunes of various rugby teams for about 100 years. So when I grew up on a sheep and beef farm in the Ruapehu district, two things were almost certain. One, I'd play rugby. And two, if anything became difficult, I'd overcome it in silence. I've written about my relationship with rugby union previously, so I won't spend too long dwelling on specific moments, but the takeaway message was basically that I was socialised into an all-consuming rugby environment where I learned and then reproduced all the dom dominant discourses. My grandfather got me to parrot only girls play soccer from the age of three, Saturdays were spent playing on frosty grounds and then wandering over to watch my father play in the afternoon. Social occasions revolved around Ramfilly Shield matches and All Blacks tests. And despite the fact that he was a Cantabrian, my hero was Andrew Murden's growing up. Rugby was also where I learned that pain and fear were not acceptable sensory and emotional experiences to share. My ability to lean on others in time to strife and vulnerability was stunted as rather than seeking support, I was constantly told to harden up, to stop being a wuss or worse, and to be a man. My father, who'd grown up constrained by the same rural and sporting notions of masculinity, was never the type to outwardly show emotion, um, and even when his father died. And sport was the one area where we could connect. This is hardly a novel or groundbreaking insight into New Zealand masculinity, but it highlights the fact that these are issues that are affecting our youth that go throughout the lifespan. So campaigns that encourage men to talk about their mental health, uh, such as New Zealand Rugby's Head First campaign, are hugely important, but they're dealing with issues um, that are long established patterns of behaviour. The cultural significance of rugby in New Zealand and in the lives of my extended family then meant this was nearly exclusively the site of my emotional education. I was immensely proud of the fact that I would watch basically every match available and while I might have struggled to retain my algebra homework, I could rattle off trivia or statistics for obscure matches. And when I travelled after school, I played in consecutive northern and southern winters for three years so that I could play year round. At the very least, Tuesdays and Thursdays were for training, 
Saturdays were for games, and Friday through Sunday was for watching rugby on TV. With cricket largely filling the decreasing summer void, sport structured my weekly habits. Through different competitions starting in different months, such as Super Rugby, and through sporadic events like the Melbourne Cup and the Super Bowl, sport structured my yearly calendar. And through World Cups, Commonwealth and Olympic Games, sport structured my life quadrennially. Apart from events like Christmas and birthdays, sport was what gave a sense of routine to my life. Or it did so until the beginning of last year. In 2019, our family spent Christmas in Northern Ireland with my in-laws. And when we travelled home, my wife's brother followed to explore New Zealand. Shortly afterward, my wife's cousin and his partner also travelled south and used our home as a base for their expeditions. And for the first few months, our house had a distinctly Irish social vibe as the three of them bounced in and out between excursions. We all kept an eye on things unfolding overseas, but like lots of major events, we felt largely isolated in Aotearoa. But by early March of 2020, when the first case um, became known in New Zealand, and with the government's response, things started feeling a little eerie. The Irish Gypsies, as my wife coined them, all rushed back to our house um, before a lockdown would leave them stranded in a tourist destination. We live in a small cottage on a farm just outside of Cambridge. We have two children, who at the time were seven and four, so with three extra visitors, things were going to always be a little bit tight. But, but after such jovial interactions over the previous months, everyone was looking forward to each other's company and the opportunity to have a few late nights together. Ground rules were laid down and everyone had a designated space. In fact, for the three travellers, an enforced break with their relations was something to look forward to. However, I didn't experience quite the same recess. I was busy shifting my papers online, restructuring assignments, and was offered some autumn papers, which were dropped when the forecast influx of students capitalising on free lockdown time never eventuated. Instead of terminating this new contract, it was adapted to provide marking relief for a faculty, something I soon sorely regretted. At the same time, my wife's midwifery training and my eldest daughter's schooling shifted online. We had two adults trying to work, one child coming to grips with learning online, one child who wanted constant stimulation, and three adults who tried to find a balance between helping out and enjoying themselves. Up until this point in my life, I'd never really considered my mental health. Of course, I was aware of other people's struggles and the work of John Kerwin, but I'd grown up in a sheltered environment, was in the dominant group for all demographics, and I have a pretty relaxed personality type normally. I also had several decades of sporting experience, which had always provided a release valve. And while I'm loath to claim it had built character, it provided a number of difficult scenarios which I was forced to negotiate. But with work, children and visitors all occupying the same space, things began to fray. It's hard to succinctly portray several weeks of creeping frustrations, but constant work interruptions, bored and whining children who miss social interactions, and having people always around always invading space, no matter how much they tried not to, and never being able to get away from it, starts to paint a little bit of a picture. Everyone became irritable, and while there were no major conflicts, there was always a lot of tension. Again, this is by no means a unique experience, and a lot of people went through much tougher times during lockdown. But it was new for me, and as for the first time... I began to question my ability as a father, a husband, and a person in general. Rather than isolation causing anxiety, as researchers suggested many experienced, it was a highly charged claustrophobia 
that created stress in our house. And where I'd normally turn to sport as an escape, to clear my head, to exhaust myself and re reset, there was nothing, not even to watch or to feel part of a wider community. Typically, sport and physical activity are part of a toolkit to combat the effects of mental health struggles. Yet in this case, the lack of sport contributed on multiple layers to the exacerbation of, this, of these issues. So after three weeks with literally no sport being played globally and no sign of it uh, resuming soon, and after finishing Tiger King on Netflix, we started resorting to watching reruns on ESPN to get our fix. First, spelling bees, then hot dog eating competitions, then cornhole, which is essentially throwing little bean bags at a plank of wood. Five grown adults would sit down each night and emotionally attach themselves to the athletes just to get some semblance of the sport that we were missing. I don't want to offend any avid supporters of these activities, but they're definitely teasing at the edges of the philosophical debate surrounding what is sport. And while I struggled with an identity that was strongly connected to sport, I broadened my horizons first through university study and then through family life over the years. Sport is still an important part of who I am, but it's now just a theme in my story rather than the entire book. What I worry about is those who are still fully submerged in a sporting life. Not necessarily the elite athletes who have support systems, coaches, psychologists, and well-being policies and a wealth of research being conducted on the effects of the pandemic, but the sporting tragics, the amateur and recreational players and the fans. Schellenberg et al. found that suspending the 2020 NBA season due to the pandemic led to greater levels of distress, coping responses, and negative attitudes among obsessive fans. If COVID-19 had emerged when I was 20 years old, and instantly I was faced with no rugby to play competitively, no touch or cricket to play socially, no All Blacks, NBC, Black Caps or Australian Open on TV, I shuddered to think how I would have coped. And there must have been plenty of young men and women who grappled with the loss of the sporting framework, frameworks which regulate their lives. In fact, just as I did, Quan and Quack found in their study that fans chose to deny, vent or avoid the lockout situation as their coping strategies rather than attempting to seek emotional support. It might seem trivial to some, but if sport is not only a strong part of your identity, but your coping mechanism in times of stress, then losing both avenues is going to strongly affect um, you in already stressful situations like a lockdown. So unpacking my sporting experiences, I now wonder about how much they built resilience. I was always able to use my body as a machine. I was a, I taught to use violence, deviance and aggression to achieve my aims. And probably most importantly, stress only ever lasted for 80 minutes after which there was always a designated period of social recreation. And this recreation typically involved discourses which promoted alcohol abuse, something that only contributed to more issues in our little cottage. As I discussed earlier, sport also shaped my masculine identity, and this affected my ability to communicate my state of mental health and cope with problems that arose. I'm aware of it, but I still have to make efforts to overcome the discourses that suggest that coping on your own is the only way, that I should never show weakness, never communicate, and never be too close to other men. I was forced to face the fact that most of my conversations with my father have been rather superficially based around sport, with no content on this topic to discuss, our discussions either stuttered or circulated around COVID and our differing political opinions. We certainly never talked about being vulnerable or experiencing hardships. 
This project's still in its early stages, but I hope it starts to tease at some of the ideas around New Zealand masculinity, sporting discourses, and the importance of sport in structuring people's lives. With the possibility that the future may hold more disruptions to sporting schedules, I think it makes sense that organisations think not only about the financial implications of lockdowns, but about how they can maintain fan engagement from public health perspectives throughout these periods. Thanks for listening.